Now, what we do here is we make beers. We make four kinds of beer. We make Bratislav Blonde, 6% alcohol, Bratislav Dark, 7.5%, Stata Hendrik Blonde, 9%, and Stata Hendrik Dark, 11% alcohol. And all the beers are produced here in this brew house. A few years ago, we had a renovation. So we have uh, more modern tanks here, more modern technologies. But the recipes of the beer, of course, stay the same. To make the beer, we have four ingredients that are water, malt, hops and yeast. And we start the brewing process by mixing water and malt. Malt is a kind of a produce of grain and this grain is first slightly ground so that the starch comes out more easily in the water. Mixing water and malt is called to mash, happens here in the first tank, the mashing tank. The result is a mash, a mixture, and we're going to heat up this mash to 65 and then to 75 degrees centigrade so that the starch transforms into sugar. At different temperatures we get different sugars, some will give a basic taste to the beer and others will later become alcohol and carbon dioxide. After we have prepared and heated up our mash and it's turned into a sugary liquid, it goes into the second tank, that's the filter tank. There we're going to separate the remains of the grains from the liquid. Huh? Remains of the grains is called drough. And drough serves as animal food. It goes to the farmers in the neighborhoods, they feed it to the cows and the pigs. It's soft in texture, it's full of proteins and has not fermented, so it doesn't contain alcohol. It's safe for the animals to eat and plus of healthy. Now the liquid that comes out of that is called wort. And this wort goes into the third tank, it's mixed with the hops, kind of uh, spices. We learn more about hops when we get upstairs. And together, what with the hops infused will boil for about two hours. That's why it's so nice and hot in this room. Now, after the boiling process, everything comes into the last tank, the fourth one, that's a whirlpool, that runs slowly, and in the residue again. Uh, at the bottom again, we've got the residue that are the remains of the hops and their proteins. What we now have is a cleared wort. And this cleared wort will then be cooled down. And that's very important in the brewery. Here we heat up, there we cool down. Hot and cold. That's what the brewery is about. Yes? Changing your temperatures and especially having low temperatures because the yeast works at low temperatures. We need low temperatures for the fermenting process. So this clarified and cooled down wort will then go to the fermenting tanks. We add the yeast and together everything will ferment meaning the wort will transform into beer because the sugar will transform into alcohol and carbon dioxide. It takes about 10 days to 2 weeks depending on which recipe you are making and then we have a beer. You can drink it but it's not advised to. You should let it mature or ripen for at least another 2 weeks. Longer is always possible but after another 2 weeks you can drink your beer. It's a good flavor by then. And then the beer will leave the brewery and go to the bottling plant New bottling plant, old bottling plant is where today is the bar and restaurant. New bottling plant is in the suburbs, a modern plant is over there. Logistics is over there, production authenticity is still in the historical part of town. Most of the beer goes there, but they keep a certain amount on the location itself. It goes to the special reservoir under the bar, and that's what you will have after your trip. That's Brussels of Blonde 6% with special edition. The non-filtered one. In the bottle plant, we filter the beer, take out the residue of the yeast before it goes into the bottles. Here we have the non-filtered version, a bit more cloudy in outlook, fuller and fruitier in its taste, and very healthy because the yeast that still is in there is all vitamins. So it's good for the skin, for the hair, cleans the blood, and it's good for your transit. So tomorrow morning, you don't eat any yogurt. We had your non-filtered beer, or perhaps two, already here. <laughs> so that is for you in about 40-45 minutes. What we have left here in the corner is laboratory where our brewers work, three male and all female brewers work here together. Everything is mechanized and automated. They have computers and testing instruments. At the end of the day, they still do their own testing of the beer, also very important, but uh, they don't manipulate themselves in the tanks. No, that is mechanized. What we do next is we go upstairs, see more about ingredients, see more about installations, history, and we go on the rooftop for a panoramic view over the city. All in total, up and down is 220 steps to take, so it's a nice walk, but after that, a refreshing view. <laughs> yep. <laughs>
Now in uh, quantity as well as in quality, the water is very important for your beer. Quality because if you have a difference in the balance of minerals in your water, it may improve the taste of the beer. But quantity also, beer consists for more than 90% of water. So important. And when you produce one liter of beer in a brewery, one can use up to seven liters of water in the production process. So it's a cost to buy all this water. Now, when you work with liquids that you heat up and that you boil, vapor escapes and this is really lost. So if you want to save money, what can you do? You have more than equipment. You capture the vapor that escapes from the boiling process. It goes here through this installation to my left. It's a vapor condensing installation. It condenses. Hot water is made out of the vapor. And so this hot water is stored in the hot water tank over there. You can re-inject the hot water into the next brew. So we save up to 20% of water and we also save energy that we don't spend on heating up the system the second time. So we reduce the ecological footprint of our brewery in this way, as well as saving money, of course. Our second way of reducing the ecological footprint of this brewery is producing our own electricity. At the end of the day, the installations are cleaned, and the cleaning water is not simply dumped into the sewers or in the canals. No, it first goes through a filter, and everything that remains in this filter, or um, the little particles that remain there, go to our biogas installation the other way. It turns into gas, gas becomes electricity, and so we recycle the building again, again, reducing the ecological footprint. Now, I shall continue upstairs flowers, but these flowers also contain something else. They contain lupulin. What's lupulin? Lupulin is a female hormone. So with the female hormone of the hops, you can make other applications. You can make them into pills by having a more regular menstruation cycle. And traditionally, women have just given birth, are presented to find a dark beer to recover from labor and to start up the lactation process. So gentlemen, be careful if you think <laughs> drinking a lot of beer shows you really a man, not correct. Drinking a lot of beer makes you more feminine. So moderation is necessary. Now another thing we have is our molds. Here we have different molds from bronze molds to more colored molds and everything up to black molds. Molds come from grain. This is barley. You could use other grains as well for making beer. Uh, rice, wheat, sweet corn, maize. Anything you like, you can make beer with that because all grains contain starch and it's with the mm -hmm. starch that you make the sugar and sugar will become alcohol and carbon dioxide so in the beer. Now how do we get from the barley, from the grains to the molds? First of all, the grains are soaked in water and when they have absorbed all the water, they spread on the floor. Even layers of about 40 centimeters and they start to develop heat and they start to germinate. The germination is important because so enzymes develop in the grains and we need enzymes in the chemistry of the brewing process. However, at a certain point we need to be careful that you don't let the germination go on because otherwise you've got new plants coming out. And we as brewers, we can't make beer if we have new plants and also the farmers don't have their animal food that comes from the beer making process if we have new plants. But today it's first we make the beer and animal food is a byproduct. Many centuries ago economy was upside down and the farms, it was the farmers' wives who produced the animal food for the winter as a byproduct, sweet liquid, the word. Fermentation became the beer. Modern times, the economy has shifted and beer is more important than animal food. Now, however, we say we need the grains, but we don't need the plants. How do we save the grains? We dry out our grains and so the germination process stops. Where do you dry out your grains? Well, we use a kiln. A kiln is a kind of high chimney. In the top there are grids. The grains are spread over the grids. In the bottom you make a fire and by the hot air that goes up, the grains will dry out and you have your mold. Now depending on the temperature of your kiln, depending on the duration of the drying process, 
depending on the humidity that still remains in the grains, you get different molds. Main influence is temperature, low temperatures, meaning 85 degrees centigrade, you get blonde molds, higher temperatures up to 125, you get the darker molds, and if you roast them additionally, black molds. And you can make enormous variations. You could use other grains, you could use other temperatures, other humidities, <coughs> and so you can make enormous variations of grains combined with all the types of water, combined with all the types of hops and quantities of hops, more hops, less hops, combine that with the different kinds of yeast. You understand that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different recipes of beer that you can make. Now, the color of your malt, of course, will determine the color of your beer. Blonde malts for blonde beers, darker malts for darker beers. The color of the malt will also influence the taste of your beer. Blonder malts have a sharper taste, and darker malts have a softer, more caramelized taste. But the color of the malt does not influence the percentage of alcohol. We do have Bruxelles on Blonde, 6%. It's not 6% because the malt is blonde. With any malt, you can make a beer between 0.5 and 13%. If you want more alcohol, just add more grains. More grains means more sugar, means more alcohol. For easy classification, we have developed a standard. The standard would mean between 2.5 and 3% alcohol. You double the standard, you go up to 6%. Triple the standard, you go up to 8 to 9%. Quadruple the standard, you go up to 11 to 12%. So triple beers or quadruple beers have not fermented three times or so. No, they're just within a classification of more alcoholic than the previous stage. Now, culture demands that triple bears are preferably blonde, but there do exist some dark triples as well. Culture demands that bears of 6% are preferably dark, but there are differences and so Don't let culture decide everything. Taste is also very important. Now, we're going to pass through the old kill. We don't use it anymore today because it's a very small scale. One doesn't produce enough for what we need today. Fire has it in town and we have shifted. The economies have shifted, so now we have professional breweries and professional motorists that use the motor for us. If you see breweries, there are about 200 of them in Belgium for number. Motorists, there are only five of them left. Motorists are very large, large scale industries today. So they supply the motor for us, and we use it now to have a staircase now with the concert hall. Constructed in 2002, it's one of the few modern buildings in town. And standing in front of us, St. Saint Stephen's Cathedral, the seat of the Roman Catholic Bishop, and the other church over there is Our Lady's Church. That's 122 meters high, and that makes it the tallest building in town. Now, there's another tower that's very characteristic for the cityscape of Bruges, and that's the Belfry Tower. It's in all the leaflets and all the brochures, but we can't see it from here because it's hidden behind Our Lady's Church. If you like panoramic views, tomorrow morning you could climb the Belfry Tower. It's uh, 83 meters high. A very nice uh, climb, 366 stairs to go up. And there's uh, 47 bells in the Belfry Tower. St. Claude came here, stood on the little square in front, connected to the brewery, took 30,000 liters of beer with it, and drove all this beer through the streets of Bruges to the bottle plant. Since two years, we've invested in something new and something highly technological. We've got the beer pipeline. So the brewery is connected from here with the bottling plant directly under the city of Bruges. So the beer goes underground, resurfaces, is filtered, and then is put in the bottles and the barrels. Everything automated and no transport in the streets. There are no private towns. It doesn't run under the streets. It does not run under private houses, under bars, or under restaurants. So there are no private taps. It would be not very useful to have a private tap because only when the brewer decides that a tank is fully ready to be shipped, then the beer goes through. After that, a cleaning liquid, after that, cleaning water. And for the rest of the day, it's sealed with water. So if you would drill a hole, most of the time you would get water, some of the time cleaning liquid, and only a very limited amount of time you would actually get the beer. Yeah. So, the beer goes away. And we go down. That's there. We go down and inside again. The blue line is the beer pipeline. So it starts from here over there. Follows the streets three meters deep. It follows telephone, electricity, and gas lines. And here in front of the concert hall on the Zand Square, there's an underground parking lot that goes to 37 meters deep. It's a combination of four 
pipelines that are two of uh, seven centimeters uh, diameter that are actually for transporting the beer in one way and to others because we have another pumping installation on the opposite side is where they send us the cleaning liquid and then it returns another one it's just sending up the cleaning water and that also returns in the other lines. There's some uh, detection systems and of course what's not shown on the picture is uh, data transport also electric cables and glass uh, fiber cables for they have the two pumping installations need to communicate the computers need to communicate also and it goes all through that pipeline. Now the other pictures on the opposite wall shows us the history of the brewery. We started here in 1856 with Henry Mars I, and we go from father to son, from Henry I to Henry II, Henry III, Henry IV, Henry V. Also works here, but he had another sister, and it is Vinonik, the other sister that continued the business. She was married to Mr. Van Este, and they left the business to their son, to Xavier Van Este. So with the sixth generation, the family name has changed. But it's not really a problem for us because Maas and Van Ester always have been connected in the history of our brewery. Veronique was married to Mr. Van Ester, but Henry II was married to a Mrs. Van Ester, and they were members of another brewing dynasty. They all had the brewery at Hamerken here in Bruges. And as the rich people did, they met in parties and they encouraged their children to marry amongst each other to keep the money in the family. And this really paid off for us because in the 1930s we needed investment Someone died in the Van Aster family, we got inheritance and we could invest. 1980s again, we needed some money for investment and miraculously, someone died in the Van Aster family and Bruyne Tauerken no longer exists today. Their assets came to us, we could invest and we could continue as a modern business, but independent family business. No foreign capital here inside, everything is family owned. But clever marriage policy, Maas and Van Aster together. Names of the beers are Brugse Zot and Straffe Hendrik. Straffe Hendrik means strong Henry. It's a strong beer, 9 to 11% alcohol for the blonde one or the dark one. And you see the number of Henrys you've got in the family. Mm. Brugse Zot means the fool of Bruges, the jester, the clown. And being a fool is the nickname of the local inhabitants here in the town. So in the 15th century, there was a prince ruling over the Netherlands. Before religious wars and before our country was split between Netherlands and Belgium, we were all Netherlands and the prince ruling here called the people of Bruges to be fools because we asked for a return on tax money. He said you're quite foolish and so that became the nickname and where we needed a brand name for the beer, something local name, uh, we asked the local population what could it be and they said well we're quite proud of our local beer and so the beer may be called as we are called ourselves. <laughs> and that's how we got the beer that's called a fool of Bruges. Now, as we go down in the second room, you will see a small statue, a statue of a saint, Saint Arnold. There are two saints important in our culture, Saint Nicholas and Saint Arnold. And Arnold is the patron saint of the brewers. Now, he's not a saint that comes from the Bible or religious texts, he's a real local saint. He was a young boy living in the south of the province, near the village of Tigan, and well, his father was a local nobleman. He wanted Arnold to become a knight and fight for the king. But Arnold, being a pacifist, preferred becoming a priest. So he fled Flanders, went to northern France, and in Soissons, near Paris, he became priest, made a career, even became the bishop of Soissons. And that's official history. Go to the cathedral in Soissons, go and look in the archives, and there's Bishop Arnold. But that's the official history. And now there's something else. It's called the legend. And the legend says that Arnold returned to Flanders. In his native country, beginning of the 11th century, he noticed that there were a lot of people having diseases. Now, being a man of good heart and a man of knowledge, he wanted to give some good advice. So he took his pastoral staff, went to the local breweries, and turned his pastoral staff into brewing kettles. And then he told the people, look, it's a gift from God. Take the beer and drink it, and it will cure all your diseases. And people drank the beer, and they were healthy and very grateful. They said, it must be a miracle, so you must be a saint. And so by a local acclamation, he became Saint Arnold, unofficially never registered in Vatican. <laughs> they drink wine in the Vatican, so they are excused. But in the Middle Ages, one said, drink beer instead of water. It's healthy for you. They didn't know why. 
Later came Louis Pasteur doing scientific research. He said, well, water can be contaminated by germs. When you boil the water, you sterilize it. And that's exactly what is part of the brewing process. So without knowing it, beer has always been a good sterilized liquid. Today, we no longer say drink beer instead of water. Today, we say drink everything with moderation and above all, with taste. Now, as we go down, first say hello to St. Arnold. We go through the room with the old fermenting vessels, bad acoustics, won't stop there. Some stairs down to see the old ripening tanks. We will have a stop there. But mind you, all of the stairs may be very, very steep. So for safety and for comfort, it is advised to go down backwards. You see the sign and just follow me. Great for 80 degrees centigrade for low fermenting beers and hard pills or lager style beers. For that, we need mechanical cooling in the brewery. Also, if you want to have the same quality of your beer all year round, it's not enough to just open the windows and let the temperature cool down. If you want to have that in summer or autumn, you might have, you might have fluctuations in your temperature, so in the quality of your beer with mechanical cooling all year round, the same temperature is the same quality. But to have this production go along, you need to invest a lot in cooling. Mechanical cooling costs a lot in energy and costs a lot in money. So with all these old copper installations, we did away with that. Since the 1980s, we switched from copper to stainless steel. We save a lot of energy, we save a lot of money, and so we work very efficiently. People standing here can look through the glass door to see some of the new tanks in the other wing, but on the picture also you can see the new tanks. Stainless steel, double hull isolation, ice water runs between the two hulls, and so we pull everything down at a low investment of energy. Also, very efficient in maintenance and cleaning. Steam under high pressure goes through the system, everything cleaned from the inside. All system of cleaning was doing everything by hand. Upstairs, not allowed. You see the man with the roomstick doing his cleaning by hand. Also, these tanks needed to be cleaned by hand. How does one do it? You take an intern, 16 years old, first job in the brewery was going through the manhole inside with a sponge and some water and clean everything. If you go in there today, it's at most a bit uncomfortable, but in the old times it was uncomfortable and unsafe. Because first the beer had been ripening, now the tank was empty, the beer was in the barrels and the bottles for transportation, but alcohol fumes and carbon dioxide <laughs> were still inside. So the boy doing his job could easily get light in his head and say sick. Now, labor safety, also very important. One tied a rope around the boy's neck. A colleague was standing watch on the outside, and when he was aware that the boy was getting light in his head, he pulled the rope and he was pulled out on that. <laughs> that were the labor conditions in use until the 1980s. Since then, it's been over to the modern ones, and that's one of the reasons why the brewers are also quite happy to have new installations now. <laughs> yeah. Now we go another stair down, again a steep stair, so again it's advised to go down back. So very new, the newest is at the end of the corridor, you will see the pumping installation and the pipelines. So that are the plastic tubes that go under the wall, under the ground, and it's the beginning of the beer pipeline. It's there that the beer leaves the brewery and goes to the bottling plant. An older installation is standing here in front of me. It's this big black machine. It's an ammonia compressing machine. It's the uh, same installation as you have in your fridge today. In the fridge it's only large like that. It says brrrr and that makes the cold in your fridge, but this was the larger one. It's the first industrial equipment in the uh, city of Bruges that was powered by electricity, so very modern in its time, the 1930s. We've always been modern in the respective times. And this far, but it was used to produce the ice water, the ice water that was used upstairs for cooling down the rooms with the fermenting and ripening processes. Today we've got something more compact, one meter by one meter, still serves for cooling down the um, industrial part of the brewery. Now this old machine not only produced the ice water but also made large blocks of ice. These blocks of ice once it is set aside to melt now they were sold to the pubs in the neighborhood together with the barrels of beer so that they could cool down the cellars and sell nice fresh beer to their customers. And now it's the end of the tour and for you there's also a nice fresh beer. <laughs> so with your tickets you go upstairs in the bar Exchange your ticket for Drexel Zot Blanc, 6% alcohol, basic edition of the beer, basic but a special one, the one that's never been in a bottling plant, the one that's not been filtered. You have the non filtered version. Cloudy and outlook, but full in taste and full of residue of these green vitamins. Good for health. Not Secondly, you manage, that's especially for women, good for the health, it's full of the female hormone nuclear. <laughs> Thirdly, there are no tongues, it's good for health, 
And fourthly, the Deputy of Harrison, who paid a hundred million of red wine to a case of dollars, hundred million of red wine for the product, two hundred million of red wine, and a million of red wine for the 40 to 45 kilo